So, actually, I'm not going to talk about financial innovation per se. I'm going to talk about uncertainty shocks and balance sheet recessions. And yesterday, we talked about the role that uncertainty plays in uh, driving these recessions and the role that financial situ uh, conditions play. And today, I'm going to argue that they might not be uh, that different. They might actually be very closely related. So, the main idea behind balance sheet recessions to get everyone, can you hear me? It's okay? Yeah. Um, it's going back to Kiyotaki Moore and Bernanke, Gelter, and Gilchrist, that there are some important agents in the economy. Uh, they might be firms, they might be banks. I'm going to call them experts here. And um, they're financially constrained and um, very highly leveraged. So when an agent shock hits the economy, the balance sheets are hit very hard. They become more financially constrained, able to demand less productive assets, asset prices fall. This amplifies and propagates the shock throughout the economy. And because it takes time for the balance sheets to be rebuilt, even transitory shocks can become persistent slumps. So at least that's the idea. But we'll have a good understanding of why uh, balance sheets will matter in an economy with financial frictions. That is, we, we understand the second arrow from balance sheets to amplification and persistence. But we don't have a good explanation for why these agents, with these experts, are taking so much agate risk in the first place. Why so much of the agate risk in the economy ends up concentrated on the balance sheets of these important agents in the economy. <laughs> so what I'm going to argue today is that uncertainty shocks can help us explain this apparently excessive risk taking that drives these financial crises and balance sheet recessions. Um, so to, to fix ideas a little, <laughs> consider this. Uh, a simple model, standard AK model, uh, driven by Brown and TFP shocks. Uh, let's say there's a moral hazard problem, so you, you know, they can't really issue equity. And let's say on top of that, that they're you know, constrained to using really only risk-free debt. So what this does is creates a mechanical link <coughs> between uh, leverage, how much you borrow and invest in productive assets, and the exposure of these agents to added risk. So if an agent is leveraged maybe 30 to 1, and uh, an agate shock reduces the value of assets in just 1%, this guy will lose 30% of his net worth. And this will create some trouble. This will, might create a financial crisis. However, the first result I'm going to show you is that if we allow agents to write contracts on the agate state of the economy, the balance sheet channel will completely disappear. And the idea behind this is that agents will be able to separate leverage, that is, you know, how much to borrow and invest in these assets, from their exposure to agate risk. So that even if an agent is exposed, is leveraged maybe 30 to 1, it's still possible for him to carry only a small fraction of agate risk. So when a negative shock hits the economy, everyone loses a little money. The, assets go, the value of their assets go down. So does the value of net liabilities and also its net worth. Everyone loses a little, but there's no amplification through balance sheets. There's no balance sheet channel. And these contracts are not esoteric objects, complicated. You can actually do it by just trading a market index. You, there are many ways of doing it. But by training a market index, you can separate your decision of how much you invested in productive assets from your exposure to agate risk. In contrast, if the economy is hit by uncertainty shocks, uh, there will be a balance sheet channel, even in the case where agents can write contracts on the agate state of the economy, including the, the agate uncertainty shock. So to be a little more precise, I'm going to look at um, an agate uncertainty shock that increases the idiosyncratic risk in the economy. Uh, so economic activity will be exposed to both aggregate and idiosyncratic shocks. The volatility of idiosyncratic risk will sometimes be high and sometimes be low. And this aggregate uncertainty shock is affecting that. So I'll show that um, this aggregate uncertainty shock will create a balance sheet channel with depressed growth and asset prices, even when they can completely hedge that risk. And it will endogenously create aggregate, uh, very high aggregate volatility, even though the shock is only to idiosyncratic volatility. And it will also trigger a flight to quality event, which we associate with uh, this kind of financial events. So let me just, to, you know, to get the intuition, let's just go to a simplified version of the model. There will be experts and consumers, and they will have the same preferences here. In particular, they have the same attitude towards risk, the same risk aversion. Uh, the only difference between them is that experts are the only ones who are able to trade and use capital to produce consumption goods, whereas consumers cannot. They just consume. Um, so capital is exposed to agate risk, which I call Z there, uh, and it is in credit risk, ex you know, specific to the agent, which I call W. And what's a, real, a little, you know, 
new here is that idiosyncratic volatility, this new T over there, is not a, a constant that would be a standard AK model, but it's moving around. So agate shocks will sometimes you know, cause idiosyncratic volatility to go up, sometimes to go down, okay? Uh, and that's what we, I would call an uncertainty shock. Um, so basically, this is what the, what the agents will do. They will decide how, to how much to invest in capital, and they will write contracts on that. So if an agent invests a dollar in capital, he gets some expected return or re some return from that. Uh, and he's exposed by buying a lot of capital to agate risk through the, you know, the exposure of capital to risk and the exposure of the price of capital. Uh, that's the here, sigma, the sigma P term. And it's also exposed to idiosyncratic risk through the idiosyncratic volatility on capital. Uh, there's going to be a moral hazard problem that will create a skin <coughs> in the game constraint that the agent will have to keep a certain fraction of his own equity. He cannot offload all the equity. Uh, he cannot sell all the equity in his project. He has to keep some skin in the game. So what this does is that the, if the agent wants to buy a lot of capital, P times K, uh, he must be willing to bear a lot of idiosyncratic risk. Sigma and tilde here is just the idiosyncratic risk uh, that the agent bears on his balance sheet. He keeps a fraction phi of, uh, of his equity, of his investment P times K, with a loading new on his syncretic volatility. However, this doesn't mean he has to keep <coughs> aggregate risk. So his exposure to aggregate risk, sigma n, is given by the fraction phi of his investment p times k that has an exposure to aggregate risk, sigma by sigma p. But in addition, he also gets this process theta that allows him to separate the decision of how much to invest in capital, p times k, from the decision of how much aggregate risk to take. And you, know, you, can, you, know, you can implement this by thinking of theta as how much you invest in a market index. Uh, you know, a little normalized here to make uh, the formula simpler. So you know, just to understand what each part is doing, if we have uh, no skin in the constraint, no moral hazard, we have the first best, the economy here wouldn't, would be just a standard AK model with a balanced growth path. Uh, you'll get full idiosyncratic insurance because there's nothing preventing you from sharing idiosyncratic risk. So idiosyncratic risk will not play a role in the economy. And shocks to idiosyncratic risk, these uncertainty shocks, will not play a role either. There's no financial friction either because they can completely sell the equity. So balance sheets or the distribution of wealth between experts and consumers, that won't play a role either. Uh, and the economy will be pretty efficient. So this is the, the baseline we compare it to. Once we introduce this skin game constraint, this it creates a financial friction. Um, so now the synthetic volatility and the distribution of wealth of the health of balance sheets will play a role. So we'll have to keep track of the synthetic volatility in the economy and the health of balance sheets. So the endogenous state variable here, X, um, captures the aggregate net worth of, uh, of the experts over the total value of assets in the economy. And since these guys are the only ones holding capital on their balance sheets, this is also their net worth over assets on their balance sheets. It's a measure of their balance sheets. So you know, we can think that when X is low, the balance sheets are weak. They have very little net worth relative to the total value of assets they must manage. And when X is high, the balance sheets are strong. So uh, you know, this economy will have a pricing equation for capital, pretty standard. You have the excess return on one side of investing in capital. And you have on the right-hand side uh, an aggregate risk premium. You know, the capital is exposed to aggregate risk, must pay a premium for that, where pi is the price of aggregate risk. But in addition, and this is the weird part, you also pay a premium for the idiosyncratic risk, the W. Now, typically, idiosyncratic risk is not priced. And in the financial market, it's not priced. But these guys, because they have a moral hazard problem that limits their ability to you know, get rid of all their <coughs> equity, they know that if they buy a lot of capital, they will be bearing a lot of idiosyncratic risk. And they will demand, it. they will not do it, they don't like risk, so they will only do it if capital pays a premium. And the more disincredited risk there is, the more premium they will demand on capital. So here is where idiosyncratic volatility, the new, and the distribution of wealth, of the health of balance sheets, X, come into the economy and affect the economy. So in particular, here you can see if the phi is equal to zero, there's no financial friction, you know, all that term goes away. And the, the more stringent the financial friction, the more this matters. In particular, um, it's as if idiosyncratic risk carried a positive price for experts. Experts perceive, even though the financial market, idiosyncratic risk is not priced, it's as if for them it was priced with a price alpha that's positive that has a nice formula. 
um, basically, gamma there is a risk aversion, and nu is the idiosyncratic risk. If idiosyncratic risk is high, they must be convinced somehow to hold a lot of idiosyncratic risk. So the price of this risk must be high. And if x is small, the, the, you know, the, the amount of risk is very big compared to how much money they have, their net worth. So it's very large in relative terms. So they also must be convinced to hold that risk with a very high price. Now, and all this matters for the economy ultimately on the real side is because if the price of capital, the asset prices fall, uh, growth in the economy will fal falter and you'll have a period of low growth. Uh, we'll, you know, we'll associate with a recession or a slump. Um, so let me show, let me try to give an intuition of why these uncertainty shocks will create a balance sheet channel. So the idea here is that experts, you know, you have experts and consumers. They have the same attitude towards risk. The only difference is that experts can manage capital and consumers cannot. So experts, you know, if you have an expert and a consumer, both with one dollar, the expert is always better off because he has the option of investing in capital if he wants to. He could always act like a consumer and he will get the exact same utility, right? So he's always getting a little more out of a dollar. Uh, so there's a gap between experts and consumers. And this gap is not constant. It changes through time in response to aggregate shocks. In particular, it's high when there's a lot of idiosyncratic volatility or when balance sheets are very weak. When all the other experts have very little money, if you have money, you're better off. Why is that? Well, the only difference between expert, uh, the only difference between experts and consumers, as, as I mentioned, is that they can invest in capital. And by doing this, they get this fictitious price, this uh, price for idiosyncratic risk, which is high when the syncratic volatility is high and when X is low. Both things drive this price up. So it, create, so it increases the difference between what experts <coughs> and consumers get. So now, if they're going to act, uh, you know, if they're going to decide how to share the, the, uh, this uncertainty shock that increases the difference between what an expert gets and a consumer gets, they will have incentives to share risk not proportional. You will have a substitution effect, basically sometimes called dry powder, that says basically, look, if you're an expert, you want to have an extra, if you're very risk, ne risk neutral or close to risk neutral, you'll want to have an extra dollar when an extra dollar can get you more bang for the buck. When returns are very high, asset prices are very depressed. This happens during recession. <laughs> Basically, when alpha is very high. And that dollar will get you very far compared to consumers. But on the other hand, sometimes this effect is called dry powder, uh, keeping dry powder for the situation. Now, on the other hand, there's also a wealth effect because these guys know that you know, during these periods, they need less net worth to achieve a given level of utility. So if they're risk averse and they want to stabilize the utility across states, then what they like to do is have more net worth during a boom and less net worth during a recession when they get more out of a dollar than the consumers. So if the wealth effect dominates, risk aversion is greater than one, which is reasonable, then the market would naturally allocate, allocate a disproportionate fraction of added risk onto the balance sheets of these experts. It could be financial intermediaries or firms. And what's going to happen then is experts will take risk more than proportion to, the, you know, to how much money they have. So they will be taking more risk than consumers in particular. So this ratio of experts' wealth to the total value of assets will actually be posted, positively <coughs> exposed to aggregate risk. When a good shock hits the economy, experts will win more than proportion to their wealth. And the fraction of aggregate wealth that belongs to them or the health of the balance sheets will improve. And when a negative shock hits the economy, they're going to lose a disproportionate amount of, their, uh, of net worth and the balance sheets will get weaker. Um, so what this is gonna, the way this is gonna work is that an uncertainty shock will hit the economy. This will depress asset prices and increase this uh, price of a synthetic risk, this fictitious price of a synthetic risk. Um, this will create a hedging motive endogenously that will induce them to take a lot of aggregate risk so that when the shock uh, hits the economy, their balance sheets or the you know, X uh, plummet um, this, in turn, depresses asset prices even more and drives the premiums even higher. This is something that's called the balance sheet channel. Um, amplifying incentives to take even more aggregate risk ex ante so that when the shock hits, the balance sheets crash even harder, causing them 
to take even more aggregate risk ex ante. And you get this two-way feedback amplification loop in the economy. And equilibrium is a fixed point of this sort of uh, feedback loop. So let me show you some pictures here. This is the price of capital and the exposure of this endogenous state variable x to the uncertainty shock. Um, and this is as a function of the idiosyncratic risk on, on that side and on balance sheets on this side. And as you can see, first focus on this uh, lower panels, you can see that it just, the exposure of x to aggregate risk is positive. So basically, this means that they will, you know, when a positive shock hits the economy, they will, uh, balance sheets will improve. And on the upper um, panels, you get the price of capital. You can see it goes down when the syncretic volatility is higher and goes down when balance sheets are weaker. Both effects uh, <coughs> will drive asset prices and hence growth down. And this is you know, the amplification you get from balance sheets. In addition, here I want to show you that even though the uncertainty shock only increases idiosyncratic risk in the economy, uh, you will get uh, an endog you will get aggregate risk to go up endogenously. So this doesn't have to be this way. Basically, what's going on is the price of capital or asset prices becomes more sensitive to further changes in idiosyncratic volatility when idiosyncratic volatility spikes up or when the balance sheets get weaker. Both effects increase. So this is also yesterday we were talking a lot about. Um, Uncertainty, mostly in the context of policy uncertainty. This is a different way of coming uh, at the problem. The, the shock here is to idiosyncratic volatility, but it endogenously increases aggregate volatility. So it's another story for why aggregate volatility is going up during uh, these periods. Um, and here I'm showing you the flight to quality event that happens during a, um, after an uncertainty shock. The syncretic volatility goes up, this drives the real interest rate down, the, yeah, the risk-free rate down, and balance sheets go down. X goes in that direction, also driving real interest rates down. <coughs> Both effects drive real interest rates down. And the price here in the lower panels, you get the price of risk, this added risk, including the uncertainty shock, uh, goes up, both because the syncretic volatility increased and because balance sheets got weaker. Both effects drive uh, the price of risk up. So you get an uncertainty shock in the economy, asset prices plummet, balance sheets get weaker, that you know, depresses growth and asset prices in the economy, drives interest rates that everyone tries to flee uh, risky assets, real uh, risk-free rates then plummet, and the price of aggregate risk goes up. And all this happens because an idiosyncratic volatility increase in the economy. Um, so I think I'm ready to summarize here. Um, what I showed you today is that uncertainty shocks and balance sheet recessions, rather than two alternative explanations for, um, for recessions or persistent slumps, uh, we may actually think of them as very closely connected. In this economy, for example, uh, experts are taking a lot of aggregate risk, creating a balance sheet uh, channel because uncertainty shocks are hitting the economy and they're choosing to be very highly exposed to this risk optimally. Um, so if an economy is hit by a TFP shock, no balance sheet channel. Everyone loses, uh, you know, shares aggregate risk proportionally. We all lose a little money. There's no amplification. Uh, if an uncertainty shock hits the economy, then you get a balance sheet channel. You get depressed growth in asset prices. You get endogenously high aggregate volatility, and you get a flight to quality event. Uh, so those are the main results. Thanks. Okay.